Okay, when I, when I heard about this, I knew I had to tell you the story. A uh, new family moving to town. Um, they were looking for a house and so forth. And the, the man's name was, was Herman, and the wife's name was Henrietta. God forgive them. But anyhow, um, and they had two kids, two teenage kids, and they're moving to town here. And from what I understood, as they were going through the final inspection before signing on the house, okay, Steve, you'll understand that. So they're going through the final inspection. The, the fact of the matter was they were buying the house with Henrietta's money. And she made that fact abundantly clear to him at every turn. So they're going through the house in the final inspection and she's saying, each room is saying, you, you know Herman, you do realize that if it weren't for my money, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have this. And sure enough, they signed on the house and a little bit later the truck arrived with all the furniture and a bunch of it was brand new from the furniture store and they're putting it out. And she's saying, you know Herman, if it wasn't for my money, we wouldn't have all this furniture. You know that, don't you? And a little bit later that day, at least, he got a brand new 4K, 65-inch LED television. I mean, it was a home entertainment system, bar none. Got it on the wall. It's all set up, and he's watching the ball game. And she says it again. You know, Herman, if it were not for my money, we wouldn't have that television. At that point, Herman finally spoke up. He said, you know, I don't mean to hurt your feelings, honey, but if it wasn't for your money, I wouldn't be here. There are some questions that it's better off not to ask them when it comes to family. We're, we're in a series that we're calling Family Frequently Asked Questions. And in all seriousness, um, at times, just the term family can bring up all sorts of questions for people. And all sorts of people can have questions about family at times. That's just the way it is. But all too often, can we be honest here in the church, the only questions we'll even bring up are those kind of shallow ones or carefully crafted ones. But what we need, is it not true that what we need is real answers to real questions for real families? And so that's what we've been attempting to do in this series that we're calling Family Frequently Asked Questions. Uh, so what, that, here's where we began. If you were here, you know that we began with... So here's the question. What is it... What does it take to become a real woman of God? Uh, I mean, what does it take to start actually moving forward spiritually as, as, as a woman? And we were very blessed to have a panel of ladies from our church that talked about just what it took for them to do that in their lives. And then you know that we followed that by the question of, is it me, we, or him? And Pastor Nick did a great job of trying to share with us, the, the, answer the question, I mean, is, does God only love married people? Is it okay to be single? I mean, does God only have one perfect person for me? And what Pastor Nick was able to show us is unless you get the cross between you and those questions, you're never going to find answers to those questions. And then we looked at the question, what makes a marriage last a lifetime? Rather than just a season, maybe just a few years, whatever. What makes a marriage last a lifetime? We let Isaac and Rebecca show us what were the more common struggles that marriages have and the solutions that God answers or offers us to apply to that. And, and I hope that you were a part of that series. My biggest prayer is that those of you who heard that and listened to that, you have taken to heart the counsel of the Lord to build an altar, as it were, of prayer for your marriage and pray over it. Well then, after that, we looked at how do you begin again? And Pastor Dan did a great job of talking to us about the fact what happens when, when it all of a sudden, you know, it, it, the family you have is not the family you used to have. There's been a death, there's been a loss, there's been, I mean, how do you start over? Do you start over? And he did a great job of showing us how the Lord can always move us forward. Then last week, Pastor Jason did a great job talking about us. Uh, well, what child is this? Uh, for those who have children, and, and the question sometimes is, how in the world do I, do I raise these children to be followers of God? And, and, and how do I keep from uh, messing them up? Or what happens when the kids don't turn out the way you planned? And he did a great job of showing us the Lord's answers for that. Um, now today, we're going to dare to ask another question that probably, I believe, every family in this room has asked in one form or another, at one time or another, where did the money go? Where did the money go? I mean, according to one survey I read, catch this, 47% of American households, that means half of us in this room, 47% of the households in America could not, catch this, could not cover a $400 emergency expense. 
they don't have 400 spare dollars to, to deal with an emergency expense. 47% of the households in this, in this country. Nearly half of American households are financially fragile and living very close to the edge. And so the question is, is there any answer to the real questions about the real finances in our families? We're not here to try to mess with you. We're not here to get your money. But we're here to say, Lord, is there any answers? for the financial battles that we fight and face. And to answer that one today, we have asked the newest addition, one of the newest additions to our staff, Pastor Matt Angel, to come and share God's Word with us about that. So would you give him a welcome today? Wow, well, hi. Hi, yes, my name is Pastor Matt Angel. I am the children's pastor here. That's kind of exciting. It's a, it's a fun time to, uh, and I feel like it's a, a really cool ex- responsibility to do this, but I had to do it upright. I, you know, the kids the kids are next door in, uh, in Kids Connect, and I'm excited for them. We've got some great children's workers working with them today. But I wanted to bring a little bit of Kids Connect to you. Uh, to, so to kick off uh, the message today, I wanted to play a little game. And so I need a volunteer from the audience to come up and play a trivia game. I need a hand in the... Okay, right there in the back. Come on. I believe your name is Adrian. Yeah, as Adrian moves to the front, I want to tell you what this game is about. This game is called... And he didn't even know that this was the prize. Win Pastor Matt's Dollar. Win Pastor Matt's Dollar. I have a real $1 bill right here as he comes to the front. And he's going to attempt. All he has to do is answer one simple trivia question. And he even has three options as to uh, what those uh, options are. Uh, Adrian, tell everybody your name. Adrian. Ah, okay. Amazing. Amazing. Oh, you can hold that. You can work that. He knows how to do that. Uh, do you believe that this is a $1 bill? Real? Real dollar bill? You want to feel it? You can't. Don't touch this. Anyway. Um... <laughs> It's a real $1 bill, Adrian. Come on over here. And, uh, and I have a question for you. I have three options for you. And those options are this. You can choose from the different categories. You can choose from finance, science, or pop culture. Which, uh, which, options would you like to, which option would you like to pick? All you have to do is answer one correctly. Science. Science. He wants science, everybody. Let's give him a big round of applause. Science question. Science. Never do trivia with math. The kids are really smart. Two plus two. For some reason, they have it right off the bat. I don't know. Um, science. Here's your science question. You have three options, A, B, C, or D. Science. The penny has been around since 17... Yeah, that's right. That's the right order, right? The, 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 uh, the penny has been around since 1793, but it has undergone some changes. What two ingredients make up the penny today? A, zinc and silver, B, tin and copper, C, zinc and copper, D, pens and knees. No pity laughs there? Come on. Okay. B? B, tin and copper is incorrect. Oh, well, that's why I prepared other questions. Let's skip to pop culture since you are a teenager, correct? Last time we checked. Pop culture. In comic books, superheroes and villains go through a lot of money. Which of these characters is not wealthy at all? He's flat broke, in fact. A, Batman. B, Iron Man. C, the villain Lex Luthor. Or D, Spider-Man. Spider-Man. D, Spider-Man. Yay! All right. Now... Adrian, you have now just won this dollar bill. There, no, hang on a second here. But before you choose to receive this dollar bill, you could, however, instead of taking this one dollar bill, you could choose to find out what's underneath the box. And whatever is underneath the box is your prize to keep. Would you like the one dollar bill or, hmm, what's underneath the box? The box. He's going to go for the box. What do you think, folks? Let's see. Go ahead and lift that up and find out what's underneath the box. Pick that up and find out. That is 99 pennies, ladies and gentlemen. 99 pennies. Thank you very much. Let's give him a big round of applause. Truth is, when you're not wise with your money and you don't make wise choices with it, sometimes it cost you, didn't it? And in that instance, it only cost him one cent. But it cost him. And uh, I want to share with you today a few things 
that the Lord has been teaching me about finance. It's kind of interesting, but you know, when you're a children's pastor, you have to stretch your budget. When you're a parent, you have to stretch your budget. And God uh, has given me a lot of examples and a lot of opportunities. And he just kind of opened up the scriptures this week, and I'm very excited to share some of these things with you today. Now, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to cover uh, the big question, where did the money go? All week long, people have been asking me that, and I'm like, I'll let you know when I'm done with the sermon, okay? Um, come on Sunday, we'll find out. So we're going to talk about where did the money go, but that question really does lead us to another question, which is where should the money go? Where should the money go? And the last question, there's a, when we talk about finances... A lot of us just kind of tune out. And if that's you today, I hope you just tune back in just a little bit. Because you might feel broke. You might feel, you know, I don't have any money, so I don't need to hear this sermon. But here's the truth. A lot of us have gone through hard times. We've been impoverished. We've had issues with finances. And the question that I want to finish up with today is, is there hope for the broke? So today I want to start off with that first question. Where did the money go? Everybody's just wondering, where did the money go? It's kind of a weird question to ask, but if you think about it, it kind of reminds me of a scenario played out in my mind where you've got this husband and wife. The wife is in a different part of the house. The husband's getting ready to sit down on the couch, and he's looking around, and he can't find the... The remote. He can't find the remote. So it plays out a little bit like this, if you'll indulge me. Honey! Where did the remote go? Have you checked underneath the cushions? Yes, I checked underneath the cushions. Where did you have it last? If I knew where it was last, I would know where the remote is. Have you prayed about it? Have I prayed about it? No. Amen. Found it underneath my Bible. It plays out like that, and I trust me, that happens all the time. I fear that God doesn't care about my lost remote or whatever piddly thing is, and I don't bother praying. I don't want to bother the Almighty God with that. But yet, somehow, there's some connection there. But seriously, it seems that silly. When we ask that question, I feel like that. It's like, where did the money go? I asked that question. Why? Because I don't know where it went. I have no idea. I have not been paying attention or remember where I put it. So that question means, you know, we ask that question, did it grow legs and walk away? Was it stolen? Did the dog eat my money? We don't have a clue where that money went. So when we ask that question, we're not going to get a straightforward answer uh, that everybody is going to be able to apply. Because that instead of an answer that we get from that, we actually have something revealed to us. That thing that we have revealed to us is a problem. That problem is a money management problem. So just like my demonstration with Adrian, um, when he chose to look underneath the box, when he chose to look underneath the box, he could have had that dollar bill, but he traded it, and it wasn't a good trade. Um, when we make wise choices, that's when, uh, when, our mo or when we don't make wise cho choices, that's when it costs us and can cost us big bucks. If you look at Proverbs 6, 6 through 8, if you want to flip in your Bibles or on your tablets or, or iPhones, there's this very encouraging <laughs> piece of Scripture. I love Proverbs for encouragement. Uh, if you can feel that uh, sarcasm there. But there is some really good stuff in there. But this one kind of cuts to the heart of, of us when we just would rather sit and watch TV, when we'd rather not go to work that next day. Proverbs 6, 6 through 8. Uh, in English Standard Version, so forgive me if that's not yours. Here it is. Uh, Go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having a chief officer or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gather, gathers food uh, for harvest, in harvest time. There is this insect, the Bible is saying, that is more responsible than most of us. Most of us, pointing at myself. Anyone who doesn't, uh, the Annie doesn't need anyone, or excuse me, the ant doesn't need anyone to tell her to do what she needs to do. It's all based on survival. 
She puts it away. And I really wish personally I didn't have to learn this the hard way. One day, I was, I was, uh, I was checking my bank account and found out and this is a, several years ago, I found out that I overdraft. I was working a full-time job outside of a ministry job, and uh, I'm like, oh, well, how did this happen? Where did my money go? And I had just started dating Jackie at the time, and I wasn't sure if I should tell her. I really, because I was embarrassed. I was. But I did, and she could have dumped me. And some of you would say that, yeah, she should have dumped me. Um, but she didn't. She wasn't happy with me, but she didn't dump me. What she did instead was this. She, she, we were on the phone, and she said, here's what you're going to do. You're going to bring all your bills. You're going to bring all of everything that you pay out in a month, every, uh, uh, all your check stubs, so we can figure this out. You're going to bring a notebook. You're going to bring a pen. You're going to meet me down at the park on a picnic table. And so I meet her down at this park that we had agreed upon with the, uh, with the stuff, with the notebook and the pen and all my bills and everything. And uh, we sit down and I had found out that she knew how to manage her money. She'd been doing it on her own for years. And so she guided me. She, put, she helped me put the things in the right order. And, uh, and, and we, we got all the way through it. And all my bills and all my check stubs and everything was in place. This wasn't something I was comfortable doing. Fin letting somebody into your finances when you know that you've made a mistake is not comfortable. Is not comfortable at all. Um, and when I sat down and figured out all of that stuff, I stayed dedicated to what I had created and, keep, and kept my budget I stopped, I personally stopped asking the question, where did the money go? Like I'm some victim. But I knew where it was going because I was in charge of telling that money where it was going. And that's exactly what a budget is. It's just a piece of paper or a spreadsheet in your case that tells, that lets you know where uh, that money is going because you are telling the money where to go every single week. Now, if you look in the book of Luke, and if you want to flip to chapter 14, you're going to see an example from Jesus. And this example I will, I will give you is an illustration. It's a financial illustration. And it's, a, and it's um, one that really does show us a, uh, about sacrifice. But he says in chapter 14, verse 28 through 29, Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. And who doesn't love that? I play with Legos all the time and I'm an adult. The kids love Legos over there. Build a tower! Woohoo! But won't you first sit down and estimate the cost so that you have enough money to complete, to complete that? For if you lay the foundation and you're not able to complete it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. And Jesus was talking about, um, in this particular instance, he's using this financial situation for, uh, to show his people, hey, if you're really ready to sacrifice, you've got to count the cost. This is where this, this connection here. But the financial principle is very, very true. You have to be account. You have to take account of what you have to make sure that you know what you can do with it. So that leads us to that next question we have. Where should the money go? Because we know we should make a budget. There's this general idea. We know we need to organize our finances so that we can take care of others. We'll get to that in a moment. But where should the money go? Well, this really speaks to the idea of prioritizing our life and prioritizing the things that God has given us, the blessings. When you're faced with the reality that you only have so much money at the end of the month, uh, per month, to take care of everything in your life. Um, I've discovered that you need to be particular about what you give your money to. Um, take some time this afternoon. We're not going to read it all. But take some time this afternoon to read the chap 32nd chapter of Exodus. Exodus 32. But let me give you some cliff notes, if I will. Uh, if, if you allow me here. It's the final plague, right? The, the, the people of Israel are getting ready to take off into the desert. And the most amazing thing happens, and a lot of people skip over this. We're all like, yay, we're free, exciting. 
But one of the cool things that God did is he, he hooked them up. He said, okay, go ask all the Egyptians for some money. <laughs> go ask them for gold and all this other stuff, clothing and silver. And what did the Egyptians do? Unbeknownst to our, our uh, brains of rationality, they gave it to them. Hey, on your way out, here's some clothes, here's some silver, here's some gold. That's very important, gold. They had those golden blessings. But what happens later on as they're in the desert is kind of crazy. Moses is up on the mountain meeting with God, getting the Ten Commandments. Aaron's down with the people. And the people start to worry. They start to get worried. And then they start to cry out to Aaron. Aaron, we can't see this God. We need to see. We need to see and worship a God. Make us a God that we can worship. Make us a God that we can see and worship. And Aaron, and Aaron, I don't even know what's going through his thought process. But he said, all right, everybody, take all those gold jewelry. Take all your gold and throw it in the fire. And, and then he shaped, the Bible says he shaped it into a calf. And the people bowed down and worshipped him. Worshipped the calf. Later on, you know, Moses did not react well <laughs> to the uh, worship of this calf. He smashed the Ten Commandments down on the ground. And the negative result of their disobedience and their, their priorities being, as I put it, out of whack. Their priorities were, uh, we need to worship this something that we can see. We can't worship something we can't see. And so, here's what we're going to do. Melt down all those blessings and make it into a calf. And Moses came down, and there were consequences, and they were not the good kind. He had, he had them grind up, melt down again, the calf, grind it up into powder, sprinkle it over the water, force all the people to drink it, and then, at the end of the day, the Levites were ordered to go back and forth with swords and kill their brothers and sisters. Everybody who was not for the Lord at that point was dead. 3,000 people died that day as a result of out of whack consequence or out of whack priorities. I hope that we do not have to suffer that prior, the, those problems, death, because of our priorities being out of whack. Now, how do you choose what goes first, what's most important? when you're trying to organize these blessings that the Lord has given you. Well, back to my story about how Jackie was getting me together with this notebook and this budget and this pen and everything and something totally foreign to me, something nobody ever taught me personally before. Nobody took the time. We had it all worked out. We had it all nice in pen, in fact. I don't remember how much I was making, but let's just say for argument's sake, if I was making $500 that particular week or month or whatever it was, um, my tithe at the top would be 50 bucks. And then I'd learn to live off the other $450. And we get down and we, we are paying the minimum and a little bit more on my student loan and this, that, and the other thing. We're taking care of those overcharge fees in my bank and those types of things. And we have it all situated. And... We get it all set and ready, and she says, okay, you know, we're done. I said, mm, nope, nope, I need, I need some savings. And she says, what? You don't need savings right now. You've got a little bit of money just in case of emergency. You cannot have an extra savings account. You are broke. We cannot find any more money in here. This is ridiculous. And I said, no, no, I really need some more savings. And she's probably thinking, I want to go buy video games or go out to the movies all the time. And, and I'm like, no, I really need those. And she's like, no, there's no more money. And I said, through gritted teeth after I took a breath, maybe I didn't. I want to buy a ring. She looked back down at the notebook. I think we can find some money in here. <laughs> True story, by the way. priorities. What matters most to you? Your family. What do you want to do this next year? What are you hoping to do through the ministry of this church? Does your family want to go on a missions trip next time? Your whole family. 
how do you plan for that? You start now. But you've got to have your priorities in the right order. It's all about priorities. One of the things about priorities is we've got to prioritize not just ourselves, not just what we'd like to do and go to Disneyland. A friend of mine said, hey, yeah, we're heading to Disneyland. I'm like, woo, I hope you have fun. I will never be there. <laughs> um, one of the things that God told us, and Jesus told us in, 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 in the Old Testament as well, in Deuteronomy 15.11a, there's this group of people, and Deuteronomy 15.11a says, there's, there will always be people poor people in the land. Jesus echoes it later. There's, the poor will always be among you. What do we do with that? And so, in our priorities of taking care of our family, our obligations, our priorities is to help others. Which leads us to the last question. Is there hope for the broke? Let me ask you, what do you think? I mean, seriously, show of hands, do you feel in your heart, that there actually is hope for the broke. Whether it's financially broke or any other way, do you believe that there's hope? Amen. I'll take amens. You don't have to raise your hand if you want to give me an amen. <laughs> but I, and, I, and I think in my heart, I have a hopeful heart. And so that's where it comes out. Maybe you've just been beaten down so much that you don't feel like there's hope for you or anybody else who's gotten themselves into something. But yet... God gives us three ways that there is hope for the broke, I believe. The first one, God gives us hope for the broke through yours and my generosity towards them. When you help somebody else who's poor or sick or just plain helpless, that's called charity. Now, living a life like that for other people is a radical thing. We're so ingrained in taking care of ourselves and what our wants and our needs first rather than somebody else. Being charitable isn't is a really strange concept. But the opportunities that you and I might have to share the gospel with those people that we we are charitable towards are greater and our chances are greater of succeeding than if we didn't. At the end of Acts chapter 4, the apostles and the early Christians were so radically changed by the message of Christ. Part of one of their things that they did in their community is they took care of anybody who had need among them. In fact, they went so far as they sold off property that they had to take care of all those among them who were in need. So that nobody would be technically in need. Everybody was taken care of. So is there hope for the broke? Yes, it starts with you and me. We have to recognize our blessings. We've got to take a care. We've got to take account of those blessings. We've got to prioritize God at the top of the list and His wants and needs and desires for our life. And then it starts next with being generous, helping others in their time of need. But to do this, we've got to be unified. Because a few verses later in Acts chapter 4, actually I think it goes into the 5th chapter, there's a couple, husband and wife, Ananias and Sapphira. And they try to fake this unity. They come in and they've sold some land like all the other believers have. And they brought, it, they brought money to the apostles' feet. But they said it was the whole amount when they actually, both of them knew that they held that. And in doing so, it wasn't that they were trying to pull one over on the church, even if that's what they think. They were trying to pull one over on God. They were trying to fake unity. They were trying to fake out the Spirit. And that didn't work out so well for them. So check it out in Acts. Because they had dire consequences for their actions, both of them. So we will always have poor. Does that make you despair? Should we just go, oh, there's always going to be poor people. Oh, it's just such a shame. Does this mean that poor people in their poverty can't do anything about it? They can't help at all. They can't, even though they've been given charity, they've, they've been taken care of, they've been encouraged, and maybe even discipled a little bit. Must they always stay poor? By all means, no. 
God gives them help through investing. Now, I'm not talking 401ks or IRAs or portfolios and all that stuff. Half of those things I don't even understand fully. I'm talking about investing in another person. When Jackie invested in me, it made a big impact on my life. When she took me aside and said, hey, we're going to get this budget thing settled. I've been able to teach other people those same principles that she shared with me because she shared them with me. That illustration is all throughout the scripture. Elijah and Elisha, his, his disciple if you will, Jesus and the twelve disciples of course, Paul, Timothy and Titus, they all followed in line and they, and they taught what they were receiving and people were investing in them and taking care of their future by changing the way that they think about things. So does this mean that we have to have it all together? Do I need to be in a good financial place and to be charitable uh, for others? Or, or, is there hope that I can be generous today, even in the midst of my pro- poverty? I personally believe, and I hope that you will join me, that this is possible. We can be generous, even if we are broke. You don't have to have it all together to be generous. You see, God gives you and others hope through your own generosity. The story about Jesus. Jesus was at the temple. And for some reason, I don't even know why, it doesn't seem like a very Jesus thing for him to do, but he was hanging out near the money box, near the place where the offerings were being taken. And that's what scripture tells us. So that's what he was doing. And he sat, he sat across from it. And he had must have watched lots of people give their offering. But the only one of real note was a widow who only had two coins that she had to put in there. That's what she put in. And he said, I tell you the truth, she did more than everybody else who gave out of their bounty. Than what she gave out of her poverty. And she was blessed for that. The story of feeding of the 5,000. Yes, everybody ate. We love that part. Jesus multiplied it. But it started with a little boy who had a little lunch, possibly all for himself. And he gave it all to Jesus. And Jesus did more with that than the little boy could ever do. But it was all that he had. You don't have to be rich or even have your financial house in order all together to inspire others to be generous. The widow and the boy didn't have much. It was, it was going towards what they believed was important. They had their priorities truly in order. Truly there is hope for the broke. 